well, thanks for having me here. It's, uh, it's really great to uh, see uh, Tay. Uh, I understand that Manus was in, uh, is in uh, India, so uh, I think that's a pretty good excuse to go see his family, to, to, to miss this. Uh, so this is um, a talk on emergency conditions of the brain, uh, spine, and neck. It's the top 10. And if, um, so uh, again, this is just a slide with no disclosures. Uh, this is where I'm from. So I work at uh, Princess Margaret Hospital. I'm part of the UHN group. Uh, Toronto General, Women's College, uh, Toronto Western, Mount Sinai uh, hospitals are part of it. Uh, this is my group. Uh, so we have 15 uh, neuroradiologists. Uh, Carl Turberg is our, is our chief. And there's four of us who um, pretty much do nothing but head and neck oncology uh, on a daily basis uh, at uh, PMH. And so as the title says, the, the goal and, and objectives of this study, uh, sorry, of this um, talk is to review uh, Im emergent imaging conditions. The top 10 is my top 10. So uh, it's things that uh, I've actually uh, come across um, over the years that I've had some problems with or things that uh, had some really good learning points. All, of it, all except for two of the cases are actually things that, uh, that actually came across uh, me as, as, as a resident or a fellow or as uh, an attending. And uh, I'm going to present it as a series of cases. Uh, so the first case, so the first scenario is, uh, is this. So just looking at this, I'm, I'm sure that some of you already know what the, the diagnosis is going to be. So it's a, a young patient, post-lung transplant, acute vision loss and, and seizures. So just looking at some of the images, you can see uh, right away. Again, I don't think anybody needs the arrows, but I'll just put the arrows in anyway. You can see the signal chains in the pons, in the back of the, uh, of the brain parenchyma there. Some more images here. So it's a bilateral process, posterior. Again, the arrows, and then as we go up, we can still see that the process is bilateral, subcortical. And then at this point, we can start seeing some changes more centrally in the, in the thalami and the, the basal ganglia. And then even more superiorly, again, it's mostly posterior, but there is some changes uh, anteriorly within the brain uh, as well. So the diagnosis, I'll get you, everybody to, to think about it. So it's. Uh, this is, I think, something that uh, most of us have probably seen, um, and it's uh, pressed, so it's posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Uh, essentially, this is reversible uh, cerebral edema. It's, at its basis, it's uh, a loss of cerebral autoregulation or uh, blood-brain um, barrier breakdown. The most common patients that are affected by this are hypertensive, so even patients with uh, eclampsia or preeclampsia. And at pre-MH, uh, where, where I work, uh, we see this a lot in patients who are, who are on immunosuppressive uh, medications. Um, post bone marrow transplant or transplants, and also patients with renal failure. So if you look at this slide, I'm not sure if it's showing really well. Uh, this is out of a, a paper um, that just lists all the various uh, entities that could cause uh, press. And some of the things that, uh, that I saw were kind of interesting. Uh, you know, beyond the hypertensives and, and the, the medications, uh, sepsis can, can lead to it, uh, alcohol and drug withdrawal, uh, even injury. So head injury, spinal cord injury can lead to that. And then medications uh, like bronchodilators can also uh, be a cause for, uh, for press. Okay, so at its basis, what we have, uh, what's going on is hyperperfusion, uh, blood brain barrier injury, uh, and endothelial dysfunction, as well as uh, overactive immune uh, uh, process as well. So these are the things that are uh, happening in, in these patients. So in the hypertensive patient, what we have is actually um, to so much pressure that it's actually leaking um, blood or sort of fluid out of the uh, arteriolar walls. We have fluid extravasating into the uh, interstitium, so it's a vasogenic uh, edema process. It uh, loves to go to the posterior circulation, as we saw in the, those uh, images. It has a posterior predominance, and that's because the uh, sympathetic innervation is, is uh, thought to be less uh, in those regions of the brain, so it's more susceptible. Uh, in patients on uh, toxic medications or with systemic illness, the thought is that there's a, an actual dysfunction with the endothelial cells uh, and the blood brain barrier that's allowing for uh, the, uh, the process to occur that's allowing for the, the fluid to extravasate uh, with uh, an associated uh, immune response as well. So that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of what's happening with press. So what do we see on, on imaging? This is a patient with uh, preeclampsia. This is a more subtle case, but you can see uh, the characteristic uh, distribution in the posterior circulation, posterior circulation, and it's usually a, a subcortical process, so high signal on the flare or the, or the T2. Another example, this is a bit more uh, pronounced. You can see, again, changes in the posterior 
uh, aspect of the, uh, of the brain in the occipital lobe, parietal lobes. But don't be fooled, sometimes you'll actually start seeing uh, changes anteriorly. So um, it's the history uh, combined with uh, the imaging appearance that will um, suggest press. So don't be uh, alarmed if you start seeing changes more anteriorly within the frontal lobes. Uh, also, as we saw earlier, you can see changes in the thalami. So again, this is something that uh, we can uh, see with this process. So don't be uh, fooled or alarmed by it. Um, and because this is vas vasogenic edema, it's not um, cytotoxic edema. So when you uh, do the diffusion imaging with ADC maps, uh, it's going to be a negative uh, in terms of restriction. So that's uh, another hint uh, as well. Uh, this is a case, this is probably the, the first case that um, I actually saw it was uh, at, uh, when I was a fellow, and it was at St. Michael's Hospital. And it was a patient with uh, AML and uh, had uh, an seizure. So we scanned the patient and we saw a little bit of hemorrhage on the gradient, and we saw enhancement. And th when we saw this, the first thing that we thought um, was that it was uh, AML, so it's leptomeningeal disease with, with hemorrhage. Uh, but this turned out to be press. So one of the things that you can see with press is enhancement. So don't get fooled or put off by the, the presence of uh, leptomeningeal. Uh, changes. Okay, another example, different patient, hypertensive, again, seeing the changes uh, in the cell size. So again, this is not uh, leptomeningeal met metastatic disease, it's not sarcoid, it's a, in the correct uh, patient, the correct clinical setting, this is, uh, is press. Another example, this patient on tacrolimus, again, another uh, immunosuppressive medication that uh, can cause um, press. You can see, again, the changes, subcortical, bilateral distribution, a little bit of change in the pons. And when you uh, look at the uh, enhanced imaging, again, you can see a little bit of enhancement within the salsa, again, even a little bit in the, in the thalamus. So again, don't be uh, alarmed by that. And when you look at the uh, gradient, uh, sorry, when you look at the diffusion imaging, again, it's going to be negative because it's a, it's a vasogenic edema, it's not cytotoxic. Uh, sometimes you can get isolated posterior fossa uh, changes. So again, this patient had uh, disease only uh, manifesting uh, below the tentorium in the uh, cerebellar uh, parenchyma. This was a post-lung transplant patient uh, on tacrolimus who, who seized. And this is another patient. This is a patient with unilateral uh, changes as well as hemorrhage. Uh, this was an aplastic anemia uh, patient uh, who developed seizures. Again, so when you see this, don't get fooled just because it's, it's unilateral. If it's in the, the correct um, clinical uh, background and you see uh, changes isolated to the posterior fossa, even with hemorrhage, don't, uh, don't be uh, put off and don't uh, forget that press could be the, uh, the, uh, the uh, pathology that you're dealing with. Okay, I found this. I wanted to show something that was, is a bit more unique, so I, I did some digging. Uh, I found this article. Uh, this is a patient with a leiomyosarcoma, hypertensive episode, and actually developed press in the brain, but also in the cord. So you can actually uh, occasionally, I guess, get changes in the cord parenchyma. So had the hypertensive episode, you can see the metastasis in the, uh, in the spine there. And then afterwards, when they uh, treated the patient, you can see the cord uh, resumed, uh, resumed its, uh, or regained its normal uh, signal. So again, you can get changes in the, in the spinal cord as well. Uh, so here we can see, uh, this is a CT scan. So one of the, the, the things that we uh, sort of have to uh, fight with our clinicians all the time is that uh, they have a patient they suspect have press and they, they obviously want the MRI. MRI would be the best test. But sometimes, you know, you can't get the scan or it's um, overbooked and you can't get the patient in. Don't, don't uh, hesitate to do a CT scan. You can see the changes also with, uh, with the CT. So this is... Um, uh, someone you can see clear changes in the uh, subcortical white matter in the posterior circulation. So again, correct clinical um, scenario when you see these changes, uh, it's, it's press. Okay, so is there a differential when you see that type of a uh, parenchymal change in, the, in that distribution? There, there is a differential. Uh, this is the, the list that um, I sort of like to keep in mind. So dural venous thrombosis can do that. Bilateral PCA infarcts can uh, mimic that uh, appearance, hypotension. Uh, hypoglycemia, and again, in, in uh, certain groups of patients, progressive uh, multifocal leukoencephalopathy can also give a similar appearance. But again, um, the, it's really looking at the, the patient's history, as Tay was mentioning, looking at the patient's history um, and then putting that together with the imaging is, is really uh, diagnostic, okay? Uh, with press, diagnosis is, is critical because it's a readily treatable uh, process. Uh, you basically treat the hypertension. If they're on um, offending drugs, you stop the medications and they actually get better. <coughs> 
Um, and again, the, the, the take home message is taking the clinical history, finding the corresponding imaging, and if they match, uh, putting it together. And don't forget, you can get enhancement and it can also be unilateral. Okay, so those are the take home messages uh, for that uh, disease entity. Okay, so the next scenario, it's a 30 year old male, uh, headache for uh, one week. And this was a patient who came through um, from an overnight call. So we were uh, reading the cases up the next morning. So this is the, the CT from, from that night and uh, it was read as normal. So I put normal in quotation marks. I don't know if anybody can see the abnormality here, but uh, there, there is a subtle abnormality on, on this. Uh, the patient didn't get any better. Uh, the patient was admitted and then they pro uh, progressed uh, in terms of their symptoms and we did a, an MRI scan the next day. So this is the MRI scan. So you can see uh, some changes here in the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. And some more images, again, sort of a diffuse uh, area of flare signal change isolated to that uh, temporal lobe. As we go up, a little bit of change in the, in the insula as well. And at this point, now we're starting to see bilateral changes. So insula and insula on the, on the contralateral side. So even in retrospect, when, you, when we went back and we really played with the windowing, you know, there was a subtle hint. So this is, a, this is pretty subtle, but it's a little bit of uh, change in the posterior insula at that point. Okay, right there. And again, back to the MR, again, you can see the changes in the uh, insula. And then on the coronal, again, signal abnormality in the medial temporal lobe. So the diagnosis on this, again, this is one that you definitely don't want to miss. And this is, uh, this is the diagnosis. So it's HSV1, uh, herpes simplex. And this is how we probably know uh, herpes simplex uh, um, more, uh, more commonly, you can see the, the cold sores in this patient uh, on, on their lip and their chin. Uh, but herpes uh, encephalitis is a, is a common cause of sporadic encephalitis. High mortality, especially if they're not treated, so it's, it's definitely an emergency. Um, in the adult uh, population, it's mostly uh, related to reactivation. As you know, uh, a lot of us, if not all of us, probably have had exposure to <coughs> uh, HSV before, uh, either through the nasal pharynx or oral pharynx. Um, and the virus actually becomes dormant in the trigeminal ganglion and certain uh, situations, uh, stress, uh, for example, can uh, lead to reactivation and you can get changes uh, within the brain. Uh, so uh, on this slide, so the symptoms, again, confusion, fever, decreased mental status, um, the typical uh, reasons uh, that we image patients in, in the emerge with a CT brain, it can affect any age or any gender. So don't um, uh, fret if it's a younger patient, for example, or a PEDS patient. Um, and imaging is really important in establishing the diagnosis uh, based on the uh, location of the disease uh, manifesting the limbic uh, regions of the brain. So just to review, what are the limbic um, portions of the brain? So it's the cingulate gyrus uh, right there. I'm not sure if it's showing up really well, but the cingulate gyrus, the uh, subfrontal uh, region right there, and then the uh, temporal lobes. So looking at our patient, you can see the, uh, the changes sort of mapped out. So the, the temporal lobe, classically the medial aspect of the temporal lobe, right there and a little bit into the subfrontal region. And on this slide, we're starting to see some changes in the cingulate uh, gyrus as well. So again, the classic locations and of course the, uh, the insula as well. So all these uh, regions are uh, components of the, uh, of the limbic system, okay? Uh, so again, uh, as we saw earlier, if you really play with the windowing, so um, this patient is another patient with uh, HSV. Uh, if you really play with the windowing, you can probably just barely see some changes there, some changes there, but if you really make the uh, image more contrasty, you can um, bring it out a bit more. So again, there's, there's a simple tricks you can do with, uh, with CT, okay? And again, lo location is key. So when you start seeing changes, medial temporal lobe, subfrontal, cingulate gyrus, into the insular region, think HSV, okay? Uh, don't get fooled if you start seeing hemorrhage. These, uh, these uh, patients uh, can bleed, so you can uh, see some uh, changes related to, to blood products uh, there on, uh, on this patient on the left, as well as in the region of the insula. If you uh, do uh, gradient imaging, um, we, uh, we tend to do gradient imaging on, on all patients. Again, you can see the, uh, the changes uh, manifest as uh, stippled areas of, of low signal and right there as well in the temporal lobe. Uh, if you do uh, diffusion imaging, um, oftentimes these patients also um, have a, a degree of restriction 
uh, in the affected brain parenchyma. So again, <laughs> temporal, temporal lobe, a little bit into the uh, insular region. Okay. If you give uh, the patient contrast, again, they'll, uh, they'll enhance patchy enhancement uh, along the surface in, in this case is uh, something you can see. So is there a differential? So there is a differential looking at this uh, slide here. These are two different patients. One patient has HSV and one doesn't. Um, so again, this pretty, pretty, pretty closely matched history will, will uh, play uh, an important part in sort of distinguishing uh, what you're dealing with. But this patient, for example, had HSV and this was a, a low grade glioma that just happened to sort of involve that uh, region. And this patient, uh, again, on, on first inspection, and a, a lot of the times the, the, these patients come in as, you know, rule out infarct. Uh, so this was not an infarct. This was a HSV. And actually, um, because of the low attenuation, it actually gave the false impression of a, of a high um, or a hyperdense artery sign. So this is a, this was a stroke. It wasn't uh, uh, an inf uh, HSV. Okay. So for, for HSV encephalitis, early diagnosis is vital. You want those patients to be diagnosed so they can start uh, their antivirals, because uh, if, they, if they are left uh, alone, there's a high degree of morbidity and mortality, like this patient has had here. You can see the hemorrhagic uh, lesions in, in the temporal lobes bilaterally, or, or uh, they'll have a, a significant neurologic uh, deficit uh, longstanding. Uh, and when in doubt, if you do a CT and it's negative, um, re-image the patient with MR. If the MR is negative and you're still suspicious, um, re-image the patient with the MR. Again, don't, don't, don't be afraid to, uh, to do that. You can really be uh, saving the patient. Okay, so the next um, scenario, 45-year-old um, male, red swollen eye, decreasing vision. So uh, this is a, a case lent to me by uh, one of my colleagues. You can see obviously the, the injection uh, blood uh, in, the, uh, in the left eye there. So again, really hard to make the diagnosis on this alone. Um, but this is an example of a, of a cavernous carotid fistula. And, What's, what's happening here, it's an abnormal communication between the carotid, which is a high pressure uh, vessel, and the cavernous sinus, which is a, is a venous uh, structure. Uh, 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 structure. Uh, and the most common causes, uh, trauma, skull-based fracture is probably the most common cause. Um, other things like a carotid artery aneurysm that, that bursts can also uh, lead to an abnormal communication or some collagen vascular diseases. Uh, just to review, the cavernous sinuses are um, dural um, line structures, uh, venous structures on either side of the cella. You can see them here and here. If you look at the, this picture, you can see the carotid artery runs through it. Uh, this is the, the cella, obviously. This is the cavernous sinus and multiple cranial nerves. So cranial nerves 3, 4, uh, 6, V1 and V2 are also uh, in that, uh, that vicinity. So again, the problem with a uh, carotid cavernous fistula is that you have a high pressure uh, system communicating directly with, uh, with a low pressure system, the cavernous sinus. So you can you have blood preferentially going from the arterial into this uh, a low pressure venous system, okay? Um, there's the, the, the classification for uh, CCFs are related to the barrel classification. So a type um, uh, A or a direct communication is uh, a direct uh, communication, some type of direct injury, for example, from a trauma. Um, so you have a communication between the artery and the uh, cavernous sinus. And then you have types B, C, and D, uh, which are related to uh, meningeal branches. So you have a meningeal branch off the ICA communicating, or the ECA uh, communicating with, um, in the type C, or type D, you have a meningeal branch from both the external and internal carotid artery communicating with the, uh, the cavernous sinus. But the most common is gonna be that type A related to uh, a trauma, for example, okay? Uh, so the, the problem with this, because we have a high pressure system decompressing into a low pressure system, uh, the problem is related to the uh, uh, reflux of high pressure into the venous uh, system. So for example, if you look at this uh, diagram, uh, there's multiple cranial nerves. Uh, because of that increase in, in pressure into this low pressure system, you can um, uh, uh, have a patient with uh, chemosis. Um, you put a stethoscope onto their uh, orbital region, you might hear a, a bruit. Uh, they can have cranial nerve palsies because of the increase in pressure in this system. Um, and you can get uh, vision loss. You can have uh, a backing up of uh, pressure into the orbit. You can have vision loss in glaucoma. And uh, you can also get reflux into the cortical veins. And you can, that can lead to a subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage because these cortical veins, again, they're venous system. Uh, they're not used to uh, handling uh, increased uh, pressure uh, within their, uh, their lumen. And this is just an example. Again, sometimes you can get pretty nasty changes in the eye again because of that uh, pressure. Okay, so in terms of imaging, these are the options. So CT, MR, and angiography, uh, still the gold standard uh, to, uh, to assess. Uh, 
Um, so the normal uh, cavernous sinus, as we, uh, as we all know, again, on either side of the uh, cella and the uh, sphenoid sinus. And the normal cavernous sinus should be symmetric bilaterally. It's uh, a vascular structure, so it's okay to, uh, to enhance. And I always like to see that the lateral margin either concave or flat. If it starts bulging out laterally, then uh, I know that something is, is going on uh, in those uh, structures. Okay, uh, so what are we looking for? Because we have um, all this pressure decompressing into the cavernous sinus, we can see uh, prominent cavernous sinus flow voids. Um, it might back up into the ophthalmic veins. You can see large ophthalmic uh, veins. And on, uh, on a CT scan, for example, a CTA, um, in the arterial phase, you'll see early filling of the cavernous sinus because of that direct uh, communication. Okay, so some examples. Uh, here's an example here. You can see the prominence of the ophthalmic vein. So again, it can be pretty subtle. You might just see a, a slightly larger uh, ophthalmic vein on, on the affected side. Right there, again, big flow void. And this is a, uh, an MRA. So at this point, obviously, we're looking for uh, uh, signal or flow within the arterial system, which we see, but also on this case, what we're seeing is we're seeing early filling of the uh, cavernous sinus, so that, that's an abnormality. You can see the, the normal appearance on the contralateral side, okay? As we scroll through, again, this is um, early filling of the ophthalmic vein, which is also enlarged. And this is another patient with uh, cavernous chronic fistula on the, on, the contra on the right side, you can see, again, large dilated serpiginous uh, ophthalmic vein, which is abnormal. And as you trace it back, you can see that it extends into the cavernous sinus. And again, large flow voids and, uh, and a bulky cavernous sinus again because it's trying to uh, handle that uh, increased uh, flow. Uh, as we know, the cavernous sinuses uh, are uh, able to communicate, so you might see changes bilaterally. So you might see bilateral increased flow voids in the cavernous sinus or bilateral thickened uh, and enlarged uh, ophthalmic veins as this patient has here. So again, bilateral. And if you do the uh, MRA, so again, it's an arterial phase. So what we're seeing here, again, we're seeing early abnormal filling of the cavernous sinus and reflux into the uh, uh, ophthalmic uh, veins. And on the uh, MIP, you can see it quite nicely. Again, all, all we should be seeing at this phase is just the uh, carotid arteries, but we can see all these uh, vessels filling prematurely, all these venous structures filling. On uh, a DSA, again, this is a lateral projection injecting. Again, here's the carotid, which is nice, but we're seeing this abnormal early blush uh, into the cavernous sinus, which is a result of the, uh, the fistula. And on this case, again, it's a circular sinus, it communicates. So by injecting on this side, we can see reflux onto the contralateral uh, cavernous sinus. And again, this is that uh, thing that we always want to look for, uh, cortical reflux, which increases the risk for uh, hemorrhage. So if you see that, there's probably a you know, 2 to 3% uh, risk for either parenchymal or subarachnoid hemorrhage in these patients. So that's something you really have to uh, worry about. That's, one of the, that's a, a relative uh, in, uh, indication for, uh, for treatment. Okay, so what is the treatment? So oftentimes they, um, the fistulous communication might spontaneously thrombose, and that's more common with the uh, indirect types. Um, and um, if uh, that were not to happen, then uh, the options would be to a stent or to balloon. So you can see the, the balloons that um, uh, my interventional colleagues uh, apply. Here's an example here, large uh, fistula following an MVA, proptosis and chemosis. Again, bilateral, you can see a lot of venous reflux. Uh, they inserted, my colleagues inserted a, a balloon. And when you do the imaging afterwards, again, the balloon is somewhere around here, so it's occluding that communication. So now we're, we're, um, we're seeing a normally uh, pacified uh, carotid. Another example, um, again, this is uh, so big, it actually looks like a big, huge aneurysm, but this is actually a, a cavernous carotid fistula uh, following a carotid injection. And what they did in this case, um, they actually uh, sacrifice the uh, internal carotid, so they put a, a, some coils in and sacrifice that carotid so that when they inject it, there's no more uh, filling uh, and extension uh, into the cavernous sinus. So that's another option. Okay. All right, the next um, scenario. So this is, a, this is actually one that I, I really remember well. Uh, I actually was on call with, with Dr. Sharma. We were on call. He was my fellow. And uh, this patient came in, uh, headache, eye pain, swelling, and 
and fever, sort of eye swelling and, and fever. And, uh, you know, when we're on call, we have like, you know, back in those days, we had like 60 cases to go through. So you're like just trying to ram through those cases. And I was, we looked at this case and I was like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Brain looks fine. I was ready to, to sort of pass it on. And Manus just said, whoa, 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 there's something wrong here. What's, what's going on with, with all of this stuff? So he, he actually picked this up uh, really well. I was ready to just, you know, next case. So the finding on this one, so let's compare the normal and, and the abnormal. So this is the, the normal appearance of the skull base, and this is our patient, right? And the same thing on the coronal. So the R patient, and this is the normal appearance. So I'll draw your attention to the cavernous sinus. Again, the cavernous sinus, normal structure that enhances, so it's okay to enhance, um, nice and symmetric, which is good. But in this case, it looks a little off, right? It's a little thick, it's a little widened. So the diagnosis in this case is gonna be a cavernous sinus thrombosis. Uh, so this is a rare process, but it's potentially life-threatening. This is uh, something you don't want to miss. Uh, and for me, I was really thankful that Manus was there that day. So it's, uh, it can arise from both uh, an aseptic or septic process. So, so as you know, the, the, the various vessels, uh, veins that sort of drain the, the face, they're, they're valve lifts. So you can have uh, flow going either way. So uh, if you have an infection, for example, of, of, the, of the dentition or of the skin of the nose uh, or on the face, you can get that process extending back along those veins uh, centrally. Um, so because all those dural uh, sinuses and, and all those emissary veins have no valves. So if you look at this uh, diagram here, so you can have an infection on the skin, on the nose, and you can get a, a retrograde thrombophlebitis going back centrally, and it can actually get back to the cavernous sinus and cause a thrombosis, which is what was happening with this patient. So uh, again, uh, the symptoms related to uh, increased pressure, so a lot of eye symptoms, so diplopia, proptosis, eye pain, uh, they, they'll get uh, backing up of, uh, uh, of congestion, so they get uh, periorbital edema. Um, they can get ophthalmoplegia because, again, because of that pressure, uh, that thrombus uh, within the cavernous sinus, which contains those, uh, those nerves. Uh, the org organisms usually staph and, and strep. And in terms of the imaging features, usually it starts uh, unilateral, but, but again, uh, as we know, the uh, cavernous sinus is a circular sinus, so it might actually become bilateral, which was what we had in this patient. And what we're looking for, we're looking for thrombus. So again, the normal cavernous sinus, symmetric bilaterally, uh, enhances. So we're looking for filling defects. We're looking for expansion because of the thrombus. And we can also get secondary changes, um, uh, thrombosis or a narrowing of the IC as well, okay? Um, because of the backup of, uh, of congestion, we might get uh, enlargement of the extraocular muscles. And you also have to keep in mind that you can get distal clots. So you can get clot breaking off and going further down uh, into the sigmoid sinus or the internal jugular veins and into the uh, uh, systemic uh, circulation as well, okay? The common cause um, that we see, or the, the, com the cause in, in this patient was uh, sphenoid sinusitis. So again, any type of inflammation uh, near the, uh, the cavernous sinus, it can lead to uh, inflammation into that sinus and uh, subsequent uh, thrombosis. So what do we look for? So looking at that patient, we can see that the changes in the sphenoid sinus. As we go back, we just see that the, the cavernous sinus are, is asymmetrically thickened on this side, and we can see some filling defects, right? So right there. And all these little black spots, these are all filling defects uh, within the, uh, the cavernous sinus. So again, thickened and, um, and uh, with uh, filling defects. Again, too thick. As we go back, we can start uh, to see some uh, reactive dural uh, changes along the tentorium as well. So again, uh, you can get this inflammation sort of spreading uh, radially outwards from the, uh, the cavernous sinus. Uh, you can get uh, propagation of the uh, uh, thrombus into the uh, thalamic veins as well. And here we can, again seeing uh, some uh, tentorial enhancement in uh, reactive uh, thickening and engorgement of the uh, extraocular muscles. And again, all of this black, black, uh, blackish uh, material here, that's all thrombus, okay? Uh, normally, it sh you should see a nice uniformly enhancing uh, cavernous sinus. And again, this is the culprit. So again, this patient was a sphenoid sinusitis that spread laterally, okay? Um, if you guys do, uh, do like we do, we do um, diffusion imaging on, on all of our brains. Uh, this is a article from uh, some of my friends from Michigan, and they actually uh, reported that you can uh, see some restriction within the, uh, the, the clot as well. So if you do uh, diffusion imaging, you might uh, use this as another hint that there's something going on in those cavernous sinuses by looking for uh, restriction, okay? Uh, this is a paper that showed a patient with uh, infected 
a nasal furuncle and it spread back, had, uh, the patient developed cavernous sinus thrombosis. And as well, there was a, a more, even more diffuse uh, change within the uh, dural venous system. You can see the thrombosis along the transverse and uh, sigmoid sinus in, the, in this case. So again, it can reach back to the cavernous sinus, but it actually even propagate uh, into the rest of the, uh, the dural venous system. And don't forget that you can uh, get changes as well to the, to the arterial system. You can see some vasospasm uh, here in this patient. And because you can get propagation of, of thrombi going distally, you might get um, uh, lesions within the brain parenchyma. So these are all uh, embolic uh, uh, lesions uh, spreading to the lungs in this case. So with uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis, clinically it can mimic other processes. So cellulitis, uh, Graves' disease, if they have a proptosis, uh, that CC fistula that we saw earlier. Um, you can get confounding processes like distant sources of infection um, or abscesses. So again, don't let this throw you off uh, from the, the primary source uh, within the, the cavernous sinus. And you always want to search for all those other sources of uh, potential uh, uh, septic uh, embolic uh, complications. Uh, so again, make sure you image the brain uh, if, if uh, need be. Uh, look for infarcts and abscesses and empyemas which can develop. Uh, the treatment is uh, IV antibiotics and treating the source of the infection, for example, the, uh, the sphenoid sinus in that case. Um, and then some uh, people also advocate uh, anticoagulation and, and steroids. Okay. Uh, the next scenario is a patient with uh, sinus congestion. We see this a lot. Um, it comes in with uh, the um, history of please real sinusitis. So in this case, uh, this is one of the cases that we, that we came across. So we uh, had a patient with, um, uh, on chemotherapy with AML, sinus congestion. So we imaged the patient with CT, again, to look at the sinuses, and we saw this. So you can see the, the changes here. So pacification of the sinus as well. Some more images in the same patient, again, a pacified sinus. And so the diagnosis in this case, so again, this, is not a simp this was not a simple sinusitis. This turned out to be uh, a patient with uh, mucromycosis, okay, so and it required an urgent uh, surgery, um, decompression, and antrostomy. And the patient had a lot of periorbital swelling and uh, ophthalmoplegia as well, so it's something uh, happening more uh, uh, centrally as well, diplopia and proptosis. And the key to recognizing uh, the difference between a, a routine uh, sinus inflammatory disease like this patient, this is a patient with um, just one of the mill sinus uh, disease, you can see the mucosal thickening. The difference between this and that other patient is that you want to look for changes outside of the sinuses. So the normal routine sinus inflammation, looking for fluid levels within the sinuses, um, some mucosal thickening, maybe some osteitis, the bone will be a little thickened and reacting. Uh, but when you start seeing uh, bony destruction, so actually erosion of the bone, uh, soft tissue changes, uh, extending, for example, into the uh, masticator space or into the premalar soft tissue. When you see that, you know that you're not dealing with a run-of-the-mill sinus, uh, sinus uh, infection, okay? So back to our case, we can see here, we can see the opacification. Uh, but if you look closely, you can see changes extending anteriorly into the face, posteriorly into the masticator space. You can see the normal uh, uh, fat within the uh, retroanatural region here is, is sort of obliterated. So there's something in the sinus that's actually coming out of the sinus. Uh, here you can see changes in the buccal uh, soft tissue. So when you see this, this is a no longer a routine uh, run-of-the-mill sinus uh, infection. Uh, most commonly, the, the cause that we see is uh, due to a fungal infection. So there's various uh, degrees of uh, fungal infection. The one that we worry about, especially in the immunocompromised patient, is an acute invasive fulminant disease. That's uh, the patient on, on the chemotherapy with the cancer or the, or the diabetics. Uh, these patients are at risk for developing a, an acute uh, aggressive uh, fungal infection. So again, diabetics, renal disease, transplants, uh, and patients on like chemotherapy. Um, when you see, when we get these patients uh, coming through uh, with that history of real sinusitis, we take it as, a, as, a, as an emergent situation. We don't uh, wait and we image them uh, quite quickly. Okay. So the things that we look for, so this is a patient, uh, AML, facial swelling. So again, opacified sinus, but looking real carefully, you have changes going anteriorly into the face. So this is no longer a routine and run of the mill. So we looked at this, we saw the changes in the orbit. So again, orbital change is, is another um, uh, big uh, clue. So you can see the changes in the orbit, a little bit of proptosis. On the coronal, you can see again, haziness uh, within there. And we called this, so this is a, a call we made. So we said, you know, rule out ag aggressive uh, bacterial or fungal sinusitis. And uh, the clinicians, I guess they weren't too impressed. They actually just waited on the patients. They just let the patient be on the ward. It was, um, 
and then they came back. So it didn't get better, obviously, and they came back. And this is before and now, so you can see the changes extending um, uh, more into the uh, soft tissues, a little bit into the retro antral region. It's nice and clean there. And the changes, again, more changes anteriorly. And then more changes, the periorbital changes extending laterally, and a lot of haziness and congestion in the, uh, in the orbit. And you can see the opacified sinus as well. Okay. So again, this turned out to be, um, I think this turned out to be mucor as well. So again, comparing before to now, you can see a lot more changes. Uh, and this is what happens when, when it's uh, left to uh, sort of brew on its own. Uh, so imaging for, for these patients, don't forget um, to image for complications with these patients. They can get uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis, they can get abscesses. And uh, because a lot of these um, uh, uh, fungi are um, uh, sort of love to crawl along and invade uh, vessels, you can get cerebral infrux as well. So don't uh, forget to uh, image uh, up top. Um, this is uh, someone with, uh, who's a diabetic, headache and a seizure. So you can see a pacified sinus, but you can see a little break in the cortex there. So as soon as you see this, you want to make sure what's going on with that, that brain parenchyma. So we looked at the brain parenchyma, a lot of edema, a lot of changes uh, anteriorly. When we did the MRI, we can see uh, disease. This is all uh, cerebritis and, and uh, extending into the, uh, the brain. So when you have a fungus uh, in the um, immunocompromised patient in the frontal sinus, breaks through, it'll get into the brain. So don't forget to uh, image the brain. So this is what mucor looks like, right? It looks pretty, pretty neat. It's pretty uh, wild looking, but uh, this is what it does. So you can necrosis and a lot of uh, hemorrhage because um, it likes to invade vessels, uh, causes thrombosis, hemorrhage, and, and infarct. So this is what happens when, when it's left. Okay. Uh, the next uh, scenario, so we're, we're getting up to, the, to our 10, so it's the earache, all right? So looking at this, so this is a patient with earache. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see it really well, but uh, there's probably a little bit of soft tissue swelling. So the key to this one is the soft tissue swelling here, as well as the bony changes along the um, margin of the EAC. So the diagnosis in this case is going to be uh, a necrotizing otitis. And we, s we actually had a, a huge run of these, I think, in the, in the past month and a half, we had like four cases come through. Um, I'm not sure what's going on, but um, uh, this, uh, this is a severe infection involving the uh, external auditory canal and the soft tissues. And uh, the key looking at, the, uh, looking at uh, this disease to, to sort of recognize that this is not an, a normal run-of-the-mill uh, external otitis is that you want to see the adjacent soft tissues. You want to look at the masticator space. You want to look down the neck because um, the, the soft tissue will extend outside of the EAC and into those adjacent uh, compartments. Um, these are the uh, canals of Santorini. These are the um, little fissures in the uh, cartilaginous portion of the EAC, and this can facilitate disease extending down uh, the neck. Okay. Uh, so the risk factors, again, immunocompromised patient, cancer uh, patients, diabetics. Uh, the classic is the elderly diabetic, with, um, and they grow uh, pseudomonas um, on, their, uh, on their culture. Severe otalgia, otorrhea, so they have a, a wet ear, um, and you can get... Um, uh, cranial nerve palsy. So again, when you start seeing these things, you know that there's something more aggressive going on uh, than uh, a, a regular external otitis. Uh, so the key on imaging, looking for soft tissue that extends outside uh, the, uh, the canal, so, and look for bony destruction, which this patient had, and check the adjacent uh, compartments, so the peripharyngeal space, the masticator space. Um, complications as well, these patients can get a, uh, uh, a, a chronic long-standing uh, skull-based osteomyelitis and they can get abscess formation. So you want to be able to uh, recognize these so they can be uh, treated. So this is an example of a patient, AML, pancytopenia, and you can see, again, a lot of soft tissue swelling, clearly asymmetric soft tissue swelling. As we go down, as you can see the swelling here, and now we're getting to the level of the external auditory canal. So this is where it all began, and then it sort of spread up, and now as we see, it's gonna sp we can see it's spreading down as well, okay? And here we actually start uh, seeing some asymmetry in the masticator space. So here you can see the, the normal musculature, the normal fat planes, and you can see it's a lot more um, bulky and, and full on this side. So this is inflammation extending into adjacent uh, soft tissue compartments. And that's another clue uh, that you're dealing with a necrotizing otitis, right? So again, you can see the obvious asymmetry from here to there and clearly a lot of soft tissue change extending down the neck. Even in this case, and back to one slide, you might uh, argue that there's some uh, changes extending uh, along the, uh, the, the carotid vasculature there. So down the neck, 
And then we can, it's no surprise that they're going to get uh, reactive adenopathy. So don't be uh, worried that you start seeing uh, a lot of uh, lymph nodes because they're just reactive nodes because of the uh, inflammation. So here you can see a chain of uh, lymph nodes down the, uh, down the neck. And again, change extending up into that suprazygomatic masticator space. Okay, so the key for this one, so this is another patient, uh, diabetic again, so that, that uh, key history, facial pain, facial paralysis. You can see the, uh, the changes in the external artery canal. Uh, the key for this one is when you look at the adjacent compartment. So again, this patient had soft tissue thickening uh, extending into the, uh, the masticator space. So that's the clue that uh, something else was going on rather than just uh, external otitis. Uh, when you look at the bone uh, window on the coronal, you can see some bony erosion, so some asymmetry. So again, bony uh, destruction is another uh, key uh, uh, finding as well. Uh, this is uh, somebody, this is what happens when they have a sort of a burnt out external otitis. So they treated this patient, um, but they didn't treat him for long enough where he just kept going on. And he actually came back for a uh, staging tumor. So this uh, came to uh, my colleagues in, in Sunnybrook and then they sort of referred the patient down to us. So if you look at this, all of this is abnormal in the masticator space. Even the, even the bone, the clavus is, is enhancing. So um, somebody um, had uh, saw this um, at another hospital and they thought um, this was tumor, so they referred it to Sunnybrook. Um, my colleagues at Sunnybrook saw this and there's no way this is tumor because all those tissue planes are still intact. If it was a mass, a mass would be you know, occupying space. It wouldn't be um, just causing this uh, generalized sort of um, uh, enhancement, okay? So when we saw this, we thought it was something else. So this is a, what a burnt out uh, necrotizing otitis looks like. So the, the, the EAC itself is, is um, uh, fairly close to normal but all of this inflammatory change was, was still going on. So this is what happens. So this is not a tumor, okay? And we actually had a, a run of these too. So we had actually two of these come through uh, to um, our head and neck surgeons in the, in the past month as well. So I guess they come in bunches, but again, all of this is not tumor. You can see the normal uh, soft tissue planes are still intact. Um, this is uh, another patient. Uh, this is somebody who had a long-standing uh, necrotizing otitis. It was left to sort of, um, to brew, you can see a lot of changes in the, uh, the soft tissues of the skull base. And when you look at the, uh, the, the sagittal, again, all of this is just inflammatory. This is all a uh, infl large inflammatory mass, and it's, um, it's actually protruding through. It's actually extending into the, um, uh, the spinal canal, so it's starting to uh, bulge through. So you can get a lot of changes uh, extending into uh, various different compartments. Okay? This was a missed case. So this is, was, a, was a headache, and they, you know, they correctly did a a CT of the, of the brain, so um, when, uh, when they were looking at this case, they were focused on the brain. So when you uh, do that, you have to pay attention that, you know, is there a little bit of soft tissue? Although it's, this is pretty tough because of all that artifact, but there was probably a little bit too much soft tissue there. And as you follow it there, again, a little too much asymmetry. Up here, you can see uh, the, the key right there, you can see some changes along the EAC, right? So it's, it's thicker than the contralateral side. And then when you look on the bone window images, again, too much soft tissue thickening. Too much soft tissue thickening. And then later on, so they didn't uh, pick that up. And then it came back and it got a lot worse. So this is before and this is now. You can see a lot of soft tissue change, a lot more bony erosion. So it can be really tough. So you really have to, have to um, you know, actively sort of search and say to yourself, you know, is there something going on in the, uh, in the skull base? So here you can see, again, a lot more disease a lot more infl inflammatory change extending to the prevertebral region, encasing the carotid. And when you look at the bone windows again, a lot of uh, bony destruction as well. Um, so again, one of the keys that um, when you see this appearance, uh, that you're not dealing with the tumor is the fact that the, the tissue planes are still preserved. You can still see all those muscle fibers and the, the separation between the compartments. Okay, it might be edematous, it might be uh, uh, enhancing, but it, it's the, the tissue planes are still there. So here's an example of, of, of a tumor mass uh, in the skull base. This is an NPC. So again, this is, this is a mass like it's, it's growing out. It has volume. It's pushing uh, tissues away right there, right? You don't see the normal musculature uh, anymore. So if you compare this, the NPC, with this, you can see a, a clear difference, right? On, on, on quick inspection, it might look the same because, you know, something's enhancing in the skull base. But if you really pay attention, you can actually see that the tissue planes are preserved. And that's a, that's a key uh, clue. Uh, that you're dealing with uh, an inflammatory infectious process and not a, not a tumor, okay? Another uh, exam you can do um, is a, a white cell scan. So this is pretty specific. So if you do this, uh, it can help you localize um, that you're dealing with uh, an infectious process and not uh, neoplasm, okay?
So uh, the keys for necrotizing otitis, again, make sure you have adequate uh, coverage on, on imaging. And sometimes that just relates to getting the, uh, the proper history. Um, look for a disease extending into the adjacent spaces. It's a masticated peripharyngeal, that's a, that's a key clue. Uh, these patients can get a long-standing skull-based osteomyelitis, so you want to make sure you uh, remember that. And then don't uh, mistake it for tumor um, uh, because um, the, the treatment obviously is completely different, okay? Um, along the similar lines, this is an, another case, 30-year-old male, severe deep facial pain. This is a case that was lent to me, um, and this is the imaging finding right there. So you um, have a contrast MR enhancement in the petrous apex, okay? So the diagnosis for this one is apical petrositis, okay? So inflammation and enhancement, dural reaction. Uh, you might argue that there's some early abscess forming on with, uh, with the areas of low uh, uh, a signal. Uh, so what we have here, basically this is a uh, pus in the petrous apex. And as you can see on these uh, pictures, you have cranial nerves, like here's the sixth, the seventh and eighth running through. Uh, so you have a separative um, infection of the petrous apex and osteomyelitis of the bone. And uh, this commonly arises or is related to patients with the otitis media. Um, they get a secondary osteomyelitis and a reactive meningitis. Uh, their symptoms will have deep facial pain, uh, fever, and they'll have a wet ear, so it'll be draining pus. And because of all those cranial nerves, they can get uh, cranial nerve symptoms, so facial pain, diplopia, facial palsy, and, and hearing loss. And uh, for exam purposes, that there's that uh, Greta Nigo uh, uh, syndrome, it's the triad. So it's uh, facial pain, so the fifth, uh, lateral rectus palsy, so the sixth, so cranial nerves five and six. Uh, uh, deficits along with an otomastoiditis, that's the definition of a Greta Nigo's uh, triad. So again, something you don't want to miss uh, as well because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a surgical treatment. Um, sometimes if they have to drain the pus out uh, on imaging, uh, you can use CT or MR looking for opacified uh, aerosols and then going a step further. So uh, opacified aerosols we see a lot, but you what you want to see is, is there any reaction along the, the adjacent uh, meninges? Is the uh, trabeculae of the aerosols being destroyed? Again, showing you that there's something more aggressive going on uh, in these patients. So here's an example um, from the literature. You can see opacification of the, of the petrous apex. Uh, this is the normal side. And the, the clue here is that uh, you have some reactive dural change uh, as well. So that's a clue that you're dealing with uh, something that is more than just simple fluid within the, within the uh, region. Here you can see enhancement uh, and central low attenuation, especially for an abscess. And uh, if you do uh, diffusion, you might see uh, actual restriction. Again, that's another clue that uh, there's a, an infectious process going on. Okay, uh, this is just an example of a patient with a lateral rectus palsy. Again, uh, related to that uh, Greta Nigo's uh, triad. Um, don't forget that you can get uh, inflammation extending beyond the petrous apex. So in this patient, uh, petrous apicitis on, on the right, dural reaction, uh, you can see along the tentorium, dural reaction along the planum. And then this patient also had uh, an osteomyelitis extending to the adjacent clivus. So again, don't forget to look uh, beyond uh, the, uh, uh, the petrous apex. Uh, so the risk factors, again, ear infections, mastoid surgery, complications, meningitis, uh, and then there's that um, cavernous uh, sinus thrombosis, they can get abscesses. Um, and uh, think about what's nearby so you can get a dural sinus thrombosis as well as uh, IC through aneurysms because of that uh, inflammation, okay? And again, treatment is antibiotics um, plus or minus surgical drainage if they have to uh, drain out the abscess. Um, the next uh, scenario, so it's a patient with otalgia. So this is um, a patient that we had a couple years ago. It was an older male patient, uh, dysphagia while he was vacationing in Florida, and then he developed uh, otalgia. He was uh, treated by an ENT down there for, for reflux. I did, I'm not sure how he got to that, but he, he obviously he didn't improve, and then he came back to Canada and was seen by one of our guys. And this is his, uh, his scan. So this is, this is a really important scan um, and something to uh, be able to sort of recognize. So the, the finding here, it's pretty subtle. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see it, but to sort of make that diagnosis, you have to know the normal hypopharynx looks like. So the, norm, the components of the hypopharynx uh, is a posterior wall, the piriform, and the postcricoid. These are the various components of the, of the hypopharynx. And the normal hypopharynx, when, it, when you look at it on an axial, um, I sort of describe it as being elongated with a, with a gentle <coughs> slight curve. So um, this is uh, the hypopharynx right here, and this is uh, the appearance of the postcricoid and the posterior wall sort of applied against each other. And you want to see this gentle curve. So if I were to sort of uh, outline it here, it'd be, it would look like, like that. So a nice, thin, uniform, no focal bulges, 
um, and nice uh, demarcation along the periphery. So if you know that appearance, so this is the normal, and this is our patient here, you can see it's, it's a little too bulky. This is, to me, this is a really obvious abnormality. There's the loss of definition, it's a little thicker than, than normal, and you don't want to miss that. Here's another example, another patient with a hypopharyngeal carcinoma. Again, it's lost the definition, it's enhancing, and it's thicker. And another patient, this is circumferential, this is really obvious, right? You can see um, it's really starting to become th uh, almost circular it's or, or elongated and, and, and bulky. It's no longer thin and uh, gently curved, okay? And this is clearly abnormal here. Again, big, bulky, uh, soft tissue. And again, this is the normal, nice demarcated, nice gentle curve, um, bulky. It's starting to um, sort of gain some AP uh, dimension, a little haziness around the periphery. This is a squamous carcinoma, so this is what um, uh, hypopharyngeal carcinomas look like. And again, these are, these are uh, tough to um, detect if you don't know the normal anatomy. So if you know the anatomy of the hypopharynx, when you see this, it, it's, it gets pretty, uh, pretty obvious, okay? This is an example. This was um, called by me on imaging. Uh, the patient had a sore throat. And so I called this. I, I didn't like that. I called it um, a tumor. I didn't like the look of it. Um, I didn't like the look of this. This is the, this is the normal up here for, for comparison. And then when you look, when you scroll through, again, to me, it was just too thick, right? I didn't like that. And I said, rule out a, you have to rule out a hypopharyngeal carcinoma. And um, for some reason, they didn't, they didn't like that. So they left it. So they just left this. And then he didn't get better. So four months later, he came back. And now you can see that it's a little thicker. And you can actually see that he's chewed out his uh, cricoid. So again, when you see that, you call that. And you tell the ENT that they got to go down there and look at it. Okay, they have to... Um, uh, resolve what I'm seeing on imaging to what they're seeing clinically, uh, or else there, there's, a, there's a lesion there. I mean, these can be clinically uh, quite occult other than some, some ear pain. So again, you can see the, the cricoid is being destroyed. Right, so again, way too thick uh, to be normal. Okay, so hypopharyngeal carcinoma, poor prognosis. They can be occult, vague symptoms. Uh, these are the risk factors, so smoking and, and alcohol. Late detection because it's, it's so deep and it's hard to look at. So uh, most people, unless they're really experienced uh, looking at the hypopharynx, they won't, they won't pick it up. You really need an experienced uh, uh, oralaryngologist. Uh, and er imaging can be really helpful. You might be the only person who sort of pick it up uh, initially. So you want to make that call and you'll, you'll uh, uh, save the patient uh, a lot of grief. Okay, so otalgia. So this is just to remind us that uh, there's various different things that can cause otalgia. So anything uh, involving the sinuses and involving the, uh, the neck, the tongue, anything can refer uh, pain to the, to the ear. So when you see that, uh, symptom of otalgia. Don't just image the ear, don't image just the temporal bone, but consider imaging the, uh, the pharynx and uh, the rest of the neck. All right, so I think we're nearing the end. So uh, neck mass and chest pain, this is something that came through. Uh, a couple of years ago, you can see the, the fullness in the tonsillar fossa. There's something going on here, just not quite looking right. You can see a, a void, or a rounded void there. And as we looked um, more below, you can see more asymmetry. You can see this uh, low attenuation structure that's being uh, seen on multiple images. And then when we looked at the lung, we saw you know, maybe some pleural fluid and, and a nodule. Okay, so the diagnosis on this one, uh, again, larger parenchymal changes as well. Uh, Locked diffusion. So the diagnosis on this one is based on this guy. This is uh, Lemire. So he was a French physician. Um, and this is a Lemire syndrome is a complication of an acute pharyngitis. And what happens is you have um, this uh, normal, uh, this, this bug is actually a, nor a normal uh, native flora of the, of the oral pharynx. It's fusobacterium. It's an uh, anaerobe. And what happens is in, in certain patients, for some reason, uh, they get a, a pharyngitis and, and this um, bacteria will actually just penetrate deeper into the pharyngeal soft tissue. So what you're having is you have a process that starts here, a pharyngitis, and that sort of migrates um, towards the um, uh, neurovascular sheath, okay? And what you get is a, a thrombophlebitis uh, going into the vein, and you get a thrombosis, and you start breaking off thrombi, and they uh, travel distally, uh, for example, into the lungs or into the, into the hips or even into the, uh, the brain uh, in some instances. So it can um, be quite varied. So when you look at this, this is another patient. Um, you can see what you're going to see. You're going to see the pharyngitis uh, changes, the soft tissue thickening. And then you're going to see the inflammatory changes extending into the peripharyngeal space around the carotid. And then you're going to see this opacified, uh, thrombosed uh, internal jugular vein. And if you see it on, on the coronal, it's quite uh, distinctive. So all of this 
just inflamed tissue. And the classic is uh, having septic emboli to the, to the lungs. You, you'll see uh, nodules or uh, parenchymal airspace disease, right? So when I actually, I actually showed this case to uh, one of my radiation oncology colleagues, I said, what do you think of this? And uh, her, her reaction was, oh, that's, that's gonna be a tonsillar carcinoma with, uh, with lung mets. So again, it's uh, us as radiologists to sort of be able to tell them, no, that's not that. This is uh, totally something, uh, something different. Uh, so again, don't forget the complications, septic emboli, subdural and epidural abscesses uh, in the brain and the spine uh, happen to the joints. Uh, the treatment, again, is clearly different from, a, from metastatic disease. It's gonna be intravenous antibiotics. Um, and uh, some centers will also give uh, anticoagulants. Okay, uh, this is just an example showing um, a patient with Lemire syndrome with a, a septic uh, uh, a hip. So you can get changes outside of the lungs as well. Okay, uh, so again, keep in mind the history and physical examination. So don't mistake it for tumor. That wasn't a, a tonsillar uh, carcinoma with lung mets. Okay, it's, it's co totally different. Um, and the, our last case. So again, it's I said brain, neck, and spine. I do nothing but head and neck. So I had to throw in a, a spine case. So this is my spine case. This came. Uh, through when I was a fellow also at St. Mike's. So a lot of this stuff came through when I was at St. Mike's. It was a female uh, kickboxer and she was working out and she developed acute onset of back pain. Okay, so she was fine, she was working out and all of a sudden, boom. And then her imaging was, was this. So I use this a lot um, for, uh, for resident teaching for mock oral. So this is something that, um, unless you've seen it before, it's really hard to sort of learn on the fly, but if you see it now and you remember it, then, uh, then you're uh, already ahead. So the, the finding here, the sagittal T1, sagittal T2, you can see this flowing signal change. It's dark on the T2 and it's bright on the T1, right? So the, the initial reaction, um, everybody, all my residents, they always want to make this epidural lipomatosis. But then I say, well, is it, what's it looking on the T2? And they say, well, it's fat siding out. And then I say, well, what's happening to the fat there? So this is not a fat sided sequence. So this is not fat. So what's bright on a T1, dark on a T2, the classic thing uh, is blood. So this is, a, is, is blood. So now the, 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 the goal is to sort of tell, tell the clinician where the blood is, right? So looking at this, it's clearly not parenchymal blood. It's not in the cord. It's not in the CSF. So it's either uh, outside the, the dural sac pushing in, or it's uh, in the sac, part of the sac uh, pushing in. So the key is to look at the, uh, the, the axial. So if you look at the axial, you can actually see the outline of the fecal sac and the, the, the disease process is actually within uh, the wall of the sac. So if this was an, an epidural hematoma, you wouldn't see this margin here, right? So this is a subdural hematoma. So that's, the, that's the how you uh, sort of diagnose this entity. And again, this is something that if you haven't seen before, um, to see it for the first time, it's really hard to figure out, but um, if you see it and, and you remember this, it's, uh, you're really far ahead. So this was a subdural hematoma. Um, it's uncommon, uh, but it can occur spontaneously or with um, certain risk factors like trauma, surgery, uh, tumor, vascular malformations can bleed and you can get uh, uh, blood uh, accumulating in those regions in, in peds, um, non-accidental injury, uh, anticoagulants, and, and older patients are also at risk uh, for getting these uh, things. Uh, this entity, so uh, the location, thoracic and thoracal lumbar, uh, sudden onset back pain, they could get motor and sensory uh, changes because depending on the, the size of the hematoma and how fast it, it, uh, it grows. Uh, the key really is to uh, look at the, the, uh, the axial. So in this case, I always look, can I see the margin of the fecal sac? And if I can, if I see the epidural fat is still there, but I see this uh, process is uh, sort of central to that, then I know it's gonna be a, a subdural process and that's the, that's the key. So on this, uh, in this article, they actually made a point of saying, look for the epidural fat. If the epidural fat is undisplaced, as you can see that asterisk is, is there, uh, then you know that it's gonna be a subdural process. Okay, another example, um, uh, very similar to the one that I had. This is from, a, from an article. Again, you can see that long flowing uh, uh, abnormality on the, on the, on the uh, spine. So again, anterior as well as posterior. Uh, the T2, again, not fat sided, dark. So remember what's bright, T1, dark, and T2, blood really fits that. Um, and it's, that's what this is. And again, looking at the axial, the key, find the margin of the fecal sac. If it's still intact, that epidural fat is still there, undisplaced, then think uh, subdural process, okay? And again, this is our patient. Again, looking at the axial is really uh, helpful. Uh, so in terms of imaging, uh, C MR is definitely preferred. Uh, CT you can do, but it's obviously gonna be really hard. Myelography, 
Um, we, we tend to really not do that uh, unless we really have to. We prefer the, the, uh, the MR on the treatment, um, stop and reverse anticoagulation if, they, if they're on it. And depending on their symptoms, sometimes they actually have to go in and, and decompress and uh, get out that blood uh, to uh, prevent neurologic uh, compromise. So for me, that's it. So that's my 10. So uh, we reviewed some imaging uh, of emergent conditions. Again, this, these are my 10, so they're not uh, the most common, but they're ones that imaging plays a real important uh, role um, that helps in the, uh, the diagnosis. Okay, any, any questions? So when you talk about um, making this diagnosis and looking at imaging that's been referred into your center, you certainly have many neuroradiologists with specific expertise. How do you handle these sort of consultations? Um, do you tend to do consults on those studies? Are you able to view imaging from many of the uh, GTA area? And uh, if we have a study and we want to consult, like how, how would you handle Oh yeah, so the, the question is, you know, the, these are obviously, um, uh, they can be pretty tricky, right? So the, the question is, how do we handle these consults? So we actually, um, number one, we have a great rapport with our clinicians and uh, they, they'll bring us, I've had, I've had um, ENT surgeons come to, my, come to me with 10 discs and we sit there for two hours just looking through those outside images. And if there's something that we can pick up, then we're good. If not, we have to image again. So I have no problem sitting down and, and looking over those images. I actually have um, some past ENT residents who are practicing elsewhere, and they'll, they'll actually send us cases. Um, they'll, they'll have their imaging there. They're just not quite happy with it. They're not quite sure. And then they'll, they'll just send it to us, uh, either by courier or um, uh, depending on if it's a, another university um, affiliated hospital, like in the downtown core, we can actually access those images uh, as well. So <coughs> we sort of have no problems with uh, looking at, the, at those from outside. Yeah. And we, we're, we're never critical. Like we, if we see something that wasn't picked up, it's not, you know, we don't make a big deal of it. It's not like, oh, this guy missed this. It's more like, okay, now we have this, so let's, let's move on. And if we do more imaging, what, what can we do to sort of move on? It's never about uh, any punitive type of uh, thing like that, never. Right.